Welcome everyone to the Cardano Effect Podcast, episode 10. The purpose of this podcast is to take high-level developer information and projects that are occurring within the Cardano sphere and break them down into bite-sized consumable pieces of information for everyday use. I'm your host, Philippe, and let's get this podcast started. So we have a very special guest on today's podcast. Rick is going to be introducing him. Um, we have our three hosts, Sebastian, Rick, and I, and we are going to get right into things because we are going to transition from last week's episode on Plutus Fest and continue talking about Plutus. So I would like to remind everyone that none of what we say on this podcast is financial advice or should be taken as such. You are your best financial advisor, and if you don't think you are, then you need to find someone who's qualified to do so. So without further ado, I'm going to pass the mic over to Rick, and Rick, Let's get this podcast started. How are you doing today? Good morning, Philippe, and thank you for that introduction. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Cardano Effect. And I want to remind our viewers that the Cardano Effect is available on audio on Google Play, iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, and Libsyn. So if you guys want to just listen to audio only, you have that available. The latest news in Cardano, first thing we're going to touch on here is that the Plutus slide, the Plutus Fest slides are available. Uh, Maki has posted them up on Telegram. And they are available on the PlutusFest.io website. I'm going to pull that up on the screen behind me, although you can't see it, just so you know you're in the right spot. That's the IOHK webpage there. Uh, let me go over to PlutusFest. This is the PlutusFest event webpage, so you know where you're at. This is PlutusFest.io. The slides are there. They're available in PDF. Uh, the other uh, note in the latest news in Cardano is the Symphony of Blockchains 2.0 is in progress and there will be more information available that's also on the symphony of blockchain symphony.activeboard.com we're going to put links to those two websites down below in the comments section or in the description section so you have links to these web pages and thirdly there's an update to the iohk web page uh, where they usually put some very novel and interesting things on the front page that and this is related to uh a a biology or a cellular division game. So if you want to check out those web pages, you'll find a lot more information there. Some of it's relevant to this current podcast. All right, next I'm going to introduce our distinguished guest. Uh, Charles mentioned him on, on, on Twitter as legendary, legendary Professor Wadler. So today um, we have Professor Philip Wadler on the program and I have his bio here. Professor Philip Wadler is a professor of theoretical computer science at the University of Edinburgh and senior research fellow at IOHK. He is an ACM fellow, a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, and editor-in-chief of Proceedings of the ACM for Programming Languages. He is the past chair of ACM SIGPLAN, past holder of a Royal Society of Wolfson Research Merit Fellowship, and winner of the SIGPLAN Distinguished Service Award. And he's the creator or inventor, one of the inventors of the Haskell language. So uh, without further ado, Professor Wadler, how are you doing today, sir? And where are you calling in from? So I'm calling in from uh, my office at the University of Edinburgh. I actually have a nice view across the fourth here. I don't know if you can see it. Can you see it? Oh yeah, that is a nice view. So that that's um, Arthur's that's Arthur's seat behind uh, the nearby mosque, and off to the other side, you can maybe see the Firth of Forth in the distance. That's a great so view. So I'm very lucky to have a nice view from my office. <laughs> and on the sunny side of the building um in the rare occasion that you have sun in edinburgh yes and today actually is one of those days it's a very nice day today uh actually we, we tend to joke about how awful the weather is in edinburgh but it's um quite nice a lot of the time compared to uh some places so, Professor Wadler, we're going to transition into some questions right now. Uh, we're going to ask a few questions, and towards the latter half of the podcast, we're going to open it up to the Reddit community. So thanks, everyone, for posting those questions. We're going to try to get to as many as possible. But, Professor Wadler, so you've reached the pinnacle of your career, the pinnacle of your field. Um, you know, you are a very accomplished um, individual, and you have... Your, your bio is amazing. You have your own Wikipedia page with all of your accomplishments as well. You have tens of thousands of citations on your papers. Everything is just amazing. So what brought you to crypto and specifically what brought you to Cardano? What's, what's the story? So um, 
Charles has done a great job of finding academics to help him out. And one of these is uh, Agelos Kiaias, who's uh, a professor also at Edinburgh of cryptography and has um, done a lot of the work uh, behind the Ouroboros protocol that's used in Cardano and also just has done work like um, putting the security properties of Bitcoin on a sound academic foundation. So what kind of definitions would you want to prove the properties of Bitcoin and to prove in which ways Bitcoin's resilient against adversaries? He's done some of that work and then done the same sort of work for Ouroboros so that you can do a quite rigorous analysis of the security properties. So um, he is the chief science officer for IOHK. IOHK funds a whole blockchain technology lab here. And when Charles came to open up the lab, he said, oh, can I meet Phil Wadler? And I said, okay. And we got to talking. And um, the end result was I've ended up working as a consultant for IOHK. So one fifth of my time goes to IOHK. And um, it's been really interesting. I knew nothing about crypto before I started. And there are some really, really interesting problems here. In programming languages, we like to make the point that if you get the programming language wrong, things can go seriously wrong and that it's worth investing in getting it right. And we point to things like JavaScript as an example of what can happen if you have a language designed very quickly by people who are not professional language designers and who don't have time to get input from professional language designers then right, it, JavaScript is famous for lots of things in it that are a bit strange. Uh, it also has some really good ideas in it and has some really good people working on it. But there are lots of weird corners that anybody in programming languages would tell you, we could get rid of those. We know how to deal with that. Um, but now there's an even better example than JavaScript of what goes wrong if you don't design your programming language properly. And that's the EVM and solidity. So, you know, normally people know things like, of course you check for overflow, but um, usually there aren't really dramatic examples that you can put in of what happens if you don't check for overflow. And now you can say, well, if you don't check for overflow, then you have accidents or frauds that cost literally tens of millions of dollars. So it's a wonderful illustration of what can go wrong if you don't have people who are trained and know what they're doing designing a programming language. And, you know, designing it's hard. I don't want to say, here, we've got professionals. We, it will always be perfect and always will be easy. It would be nice if we could say that. But I think we can say it will be better than if you don't use professionals. Oh, Professor, you brought up something really interesting. I was watching your videos. I've watched your videos for a while before, and I was reviewing another one uh, last night, and you had brought up overflow. It was a little over a year old and it was interesting because uh, the overflow had to do, now I'm not a software engineer, I don't know anything about it, but I, I do do my homework, do some research. And uh, you had discussed in one of the videos that it was unbounded integers can cause the overflow. I actually wrote that in my notes. Um, is that what you mean by overflow? And and I think in- uh, Okay, so not an integer. you have a word of a fixed size? That's what oh, it was, it was that video. Days. Uh, so typically in computer, you have 64-bit word. In um, the EVM, they use four of those, so you've got 256-bit words. So that's a big number. Nonetheless, you can add two big numbers, and it won't fit anymore if your numbers are big enough. So that's called overflow. You would get underflow if you subtracted a larger number from a smaller number, so it goes negative. Um, instead of getting a negative number, you get a very big positive number. So there was one scam for uh, Ethereum that was based on, they, uh, it was quite interesting, it was something called Monero Gold. But the name was picked so they would think it was like Monero, which is a very interesting, respectable cryptocurrency. Monero Gold had nothing to do with it except for stealing the name. Uh, and it was just a token available on Ethereum. And one of the things they had in the smart contract was that you could burn a little bit of the money. What they did was they um, set that parameter to cause, as it were, an underflow. And so the amount of money went from 
whatever, some finite amount to 256 bits of ones. That's a very big number, like lots more than the number of grains of sand on earth. And um, so they suddenly created a huge amount of this currency, which of course became valueless, each individual one, but they sold off a lot before people noticed that and made their money that way. Oh, that's, I'm glad you explained that because I had no idea how that hack occurred. And that does affect in, individuals like me who are not programmers uh, because I'm a trader, you know, and if an error like that is possible, I would want to know that and say, oh, if that, that currency is not secure. Um, so did, did you ever figure out a solution to, the, to that issue, the overflow? So there's a standard solution to this, which is that if overflow happens, you raise some kind of exception. You say something went wrong here and you discontinue normal execution of the program. So um, in particular in Plutus, if this happens, you just say, um, right, the program failed and nothing more occurs. Okay, you know what else was funny in that video was you, uh, you said something, uh, there were, were, were two teachers that you had in the past and I wish I could remember their names, but I didn't write them down. But they said, quote, uh, Premature optimization is the root of all evil. Can you uh, explain to us, the viewers, what does that mean? This premature optimization is the root of all evil. What does that mean to us, uh, someone who designs software languages? Right. So you must have seen the video of the talk I gave at the IOHK annual meeting in Lisbon last year. Yes, sir. You said that was in Lisbon. That is correct. Right. So, um, indeed, uh, in that talk, I referred to Donald Knuth, who is an old teacher of mine, and Tony Hoare, who um, was the head of the lab at Oxford when I was a um, postdoc at Oxford. And both of them at different times have said, premature optimization is the root of all evil. And I brought that up because in fact, we've got two different competing languages that we're working on at IOHK for smart contracts. The other is IELA, done by Gregorio Rosu at, um, runtime validation and uh, the University of Illinois, if I've got that right. And uh, so YEL is an interesting language. It's based on LLVM, but trying to be a bit more reliable. So for instance, it has unbounded integers, which is another way of not having overflow, but it's a very low level machine. So low level is machines are great if you want to be really efficient, if that's the thing that's most important to you. Uh, I think that for smart contracts, that's not really what you care about. What you care about is that this contract does what you think it does. Uh, so that's much easier to do if you write your programs at a high level than at a whole le low level. That will cost you efficiency, but very little of the time in executing a transaction is in executing the smart contract itself. The thing that's really expensive computationally is the crypto. Crypto primitives are, um, I think, pretty much of necessity quite expensive. So um, that's great. That gives us a lot of flexibility. It says we, there's something we can give up on to get, get something else. So you can give up on efficiency to try to gain in clarity. That was the point that I was trying to make. And that is in the video. So I definitely got to link that down below in the descriptions. And uh, there was something else that I was wondering about. Um, in, in that video, you described Yella uh, and Plutus, and you compared the, that they were, you know, two two competing uh, languages here. What what is the purpose of creating Plutus as opposed to Yella? What are the advantages of of doing that? So um, Plutus actually was here first. Plutus was here before I joined on as a consultant at IOHK. Uh, so um, I've done most of my work in functional languages and much of, most of that in a particular functional language called Haskell. Uh, and Haskell's been adopted by certain places, again, where their, more, their prime concern is to get it right. So Haskell is somewhat less efficient than using C++ if what you're doing is scientific programming, like large arrays. Now, we're not actually doing large arrays here, so I'm not sure what comparisons have been done of the efficiency. Haskell's been getting more and more efficient over the years. So um, I would not want to give the false impression that, okay, in order to be clear here, we've had to give up on efficiency, because in fact, after 30 years of using functional languages, we've gotten pretty good 
on the efficiency side as well. We are slower for certain applications like scientific programming. I'm not sure to what extent that applies for things like crypto. Uh, but anyhow, uh, they want highly reliable software so they, that they can write rapidly. And so they've used Haskell. A few other places are doing the same thing. Like most banks will be using a functional language and quite a few banks have adopted Haskell. So IOHK has adopted Haskell for implementing much of Cardano uh, in order to ensure that it's a more reliable system. Uh, so they were already heavily using Haskell and they decide to base their smart contract language Plutus on Haskell. So when I came in, I started reviewing it and then after a while I made some suggestions to change various things in a direction that I hope would enhance the reliability of the language. So um, Plutus um, started from Haskell, but it's now actually, um, well, the two parts of Plutus, this gets into what you just mentioned about off-chain and on-chain. So um, uh, another person from the Haskell community that IOHK has hired is Manuel Chakravarti. So he's actually the lead of the Plutus project, not me, because he can do it half time and I only have uh, one day a week available. Uh, and also, unlike me, he's got lots of experience with developers, and unlike me, he had some previous experience with crypto. So he knew something I didn't, which is that when you write uh, a program to run on something like Ethereum, then uh, the example he likes to point to is um, a crowdfunding smart contract. And um, he found eight specific ones that we had some numbers to look at. I don't have those numbers in front of me, but basically you write a certain number of lines of solidity. And then to drive that, you also need to write some stuff in JavaScript that can run in your wallet and that you can um, invoke to then invoke stuff, the transactions that you need to run the smart contract. And in fact, this particular thing, which was quite typical, I think, it had a few more lines of, it had like 80 lines of solidity and 120 lines of JavaScript of that order. Those are not the exact numbers. Um, so you end up having to write in two different languages. And clearly that makes things more difficult. Right? Generally speaking, right, if you have to work in two languages rather than one, it's not gonna be twice as difficult. It's gonna be more than twice as difficult because you've got one language, the other language and making them work together. Uh, so he cottoned on to that, and we have some standard techniques and programming languages to use to apply to this sort of thing. I knew about some of them because it turns out a similar problem comes up with web servers. You've got stuff that runs on the server, stuff that runs on the client, and those are usually written in different languages. Like your server will be written in Java and in SQL, so two different languages already, and then your client will be written in JavaScript. So there are um, a number of groups, and we were one of them, that said, right, let's have a single language for programming all of that. So we've got a language at Edinburgh called Lynx, where you write everything in Lynx. Uh, we'll run Lynx directly on the server, and then we compile Lynx to JavaScript to run on the client. And then we've also specially developed Lynx so that it's easy to get Lynx to um, drive a database server that uses SQL. So we generate SQL from links. So you write everything in links and then you get other stuff. Interestingly, the same time we were doing links, Microsoft started a project called Link, L-I-N-Q, uh, which uses very similar ideas. And um, the guy running that, Eric Meyer, came from the functional programming community. So we were both inspired by the same set of ideas. I would sort of joke about it and say it was the only time I did research work that was commercialized slightly before we did the research. That's a pretty novel idea to write one programming language to do everything that you need instead of all these different languages. Um, I, when I was doing research and looking up your name, I looked up you know inventors of programming languages and had Grace Hopper and everybody else in there. And I didn't realize, wow, there is a lot of different programming languages. And it's something that might help shed some light on uh, some of the questions that came up, like uh, understanding Haskell or understanding Plutus is um, I, I'd like to ask Sebastian. Sebastian, you you program in many different languages, and then you've seen Haskell. You've seen Haskell code. Did you recognize it as a software engineer? Were you able to look at Haskell and say, "Yeah, that kind of makes sense"? Or uh, have you learned a little bit about Haskell or Plutus? 
Yeah, I mean, I think every programming language has some core shared concepts. So usually the hardest thing in computer science is learning your first programming language. And once you learn your first programming language, then it's easier to make the next step. Haskell, of course, being a functional programming language is part of a different tree of languages. And so it requires for people who are not used to it an extra step to, to move into this different branch. But once you, you, you're familiar with one functional programming language, usually moving to another is not that hard. They're all uh, very similar in that family. And so Plutus uh, falls into the, the, the functional uh, branch of, of programming languages. And so for somebody who knows Haskell, which every year becomes increasingly easier to learn, it should not be too hard to kind of move into this space. But one question I, I want to ask that's kind of relevant to this is if you look at old presentations by iOS K, Plutus was originally kind of pitched as similar to Haskell, but not Haskell. It's like some simpler uh, functional programming language that should be easier to use and only has you know certain features related to smart contracts. And over time, this has evolved kind of to being Haskell plus uh, Plutus TX, which is embedded inside your Haskell program. And so I'm curious as to kind of the evolution uh, of the design and why the I was kid decided to basically go kind of all in on, on Haskell, even on, on the smart contract side. Uh, right. So um, the Plutus was always designed to look like Haskell. Um, but um, it was when Manuel came on board, which was only um, after the Lisbon meeting last year, that we realized, oh, there are these two different issues. You need to have the off-chain stuff and the on-chain stuff. And then we uh, came up with the solution of doing it all in Haskell and then using uh, Haskell to generate the on-chain stuff. So you run the Haskell off-chain, it does all the off-chain stuff for you and you also use it to generate the on-chain stuff. So a standard technique in programming languages is something called metaprogramming. So that's a program that generates another program. And it's really pretty straightforward, right? The real representation of a program is as a tree. And hey, trees are a data structure that programs can manipulate. So it's all fairly straightforward. Um, to make it easy to write the tree, you'd like to write it in the same syntax that you write programs in the language. So you just put a, um, a marker in the language that says, here, I'm now writing a program. And this is going to be data for my program. Uh, and that's called metaprogramming. Uh, and you have some kind of symbol. So the technical name for this is quotation. You have a bit of your program in quotes. And that would be the bit that um, runs on-chain rather than off-chain. Uh, so we've, we've got some special symbols in Haskell. They've been there for a long time. It's something called template Haskell that lets you write programs inside Haskell using Haskell. And so what um, Plutus TX is, is just the subset of Haskell that we can compile to run on the chain. Because not everything runs on the chain, obviously. Uh, so the bits that we can run on the chain is that's the subset of Haskell that we use. And then we compile that down to a different language that we call Plutus Core. Uh, so any developer using Plutus doesn't really need to know Plutus Core. They just need to know Haskell and the subset of Haskell that can compile to Plutus Core. And that's it. That's all they need to know. But then actually running on the blockchain, we have Plutus Core. And Plutus Core is much, much, much simpler than Haskell. You would like to validate stuff. To validate stuff, you'd like to actually prove mathematically that it has certain properties. And to do that, you want to have a really simple model of what you're doing. Uh, and even though um, uh, Haskell being a functional language, it's a lot easier to reason about than an imperative language usually. The reason for that being, by the way, in an imperative language, you've got state. And anybody can change the state at any time. Uh, and particularly in a concurrent world, somebody else might change the state underneath you. And that gets really difficult. In Haskell, there is no notion of state. Um, you just have values. There's a special way of manipulating state where you treat the state, the thing that manipulates the state is itself a value. 
Uh, so everything is all done with values. That makes it much easier to reason about. So for developers, they use Haskell, and then they use a subset of Haskell inside quotation marks called um, Plutus TX. But all of that is basically just Haskell. It compiles to something called Plutus Core, which is uh, in one-to-one -one correspondence with Plutus TX. So we've picked a very simple subset of Haskell. And the reason for that is, even though Haskell is easy to reason about, it's quite a large language. And what you want is something that has no hidden corners at all. So Plutus Core is a very, very tiny language. And it started out, in fact, a bit larger. And um, one of the things I did in this Lisbon talk is I said, you know what we should do is make this really, really tiny. And uh, what we ended up doing was picking a language that's been around since the 70s, uh, and which is basically just a small extension of Lambda Calculus, which has been around since the 1930s. So we're basically using a programming language that's a bit older than stored program computers. And one reason for doing that is you don't want to have hard forks very often, right? When you do a design, you want to get it right. You don't want to have to change it when you discover you've left something out. So by picking something that is, uh, has been around since before there were computers, we hope that there are not lots of little hidden corners here and that that will help us to make things more reliable. Uh, if you look at something like the EVM, it's got lots of hidden corners, lots of places where there are like two different ways of doing the same thing, or lots of places like to do this thing safely, you must make sure to check that everything went right afterwards, rather than just having it raise an exception, have everything shut down if something went wrong. You're supposed to explicitly check. So there's a whole industry of people just saying, here, I will make your uh, Ethereum program more reliable because I will check the solidity to make sure it doesn't have these commonly known errors. Whereas what you'd like to do is design a language that just doesn't have those errors in it. So by picking something that's so old and so simple, um, I think there's a whole class of errors that we can just rule out. That's not going to be there. Uh, and then we can start looking for the much more subtle errors instead. Yeah. So on the topic of Plutus Core, I would describe Plutus Core as a rigorous application of well-known constructs. So one of my questions that I'd like you to, to kind of explain to people is what is the merit of designing Plutus Core uh, with an IOSK as opposed to other uh, possible options, right? If uh, these are based on well-known constructs uh, and also well-known ideas such as CK machines, CEK machines, and all this kind of stuff, Mm -hmm. Has there been anybody that has done something similar? And why did IOHK have to basically uh, use these constructs to make their, their own simple uh, base language? That's a really good question because um, it's always much better if you can just build on somebody else's work. Um, if you can't do that, the next best thing is what we're doing, which is to do it open source so everybody can look at it you get lots of eyeballs on it, and um, hopefully you can team up with other people so that you can get it right. Um, so uh, if somebody else had taken something that was this simple and just used that, that would be great. Um, but uh, right, cryptocurrency actually suddenly puts a real high premium on getting things right much higher than before. Uh, and as I said, at the same time, you don't need to worry so much about efficiency because all your time is being spent on the crypto primitives anyway. If it takes just slightly longer to execute your program, it doesn't matter. Uh, that unique combination, I don't think, has occurred before. So um, I think that's why you don't find this. There's one other language out there that's been developed for cryptocurrencies, Simplicity, which is also very simple. But simplicity has slightly different goals. And in particular, um, in simplicity, you can't write a loop that runs for an arbitrary amount of time based on what you're doing. So um, uh, 
the technical phrase for this, for not being able to do anything that a computer program can do, is you say it's not Turing complete. The simplicity just deals with a, a small subset of programs, which is different uh, than what Plutus can do. Plutus can run any program that a computer can run. So nobody else is looking. Well, there are some other things out there like um, Mickelson that are again trying to use a simple functional language, which is great. Mickelson has a rather weird design, the weird bits of it again being around efficiency. So I think that's a mistake that um, you should just do a very straightforward design, not worried about efficiency. So um, in the cryptocurrency world, Plutus is unique in that way. And then Plutus is also unique in that um, in other applications, they're using stuff like Haskell, which as I said, is quite large. If you want to formally verify it, it's a bit too large for making that easy. Do you need some kind of small subset to deal with, which is exactly what we're doing. Yeah, Perfect. and so you're speaking, sorry, Rick, do you wanna go? Oh yeah, I was gonna ask a real simple question. I've I've heard of Turing, Turing Complete before. Can uh, Sebastian, do you have like a brief description of what Turing Complete means? Oh boy, I mean, that, that's an entire course in university. But basically, oh. uh, the, the really simple thing is, can a language compute the same thing as any other programming language? Would be like the, the super simple way to explain it, right? Can can my program basically simulate Java? Can it simulate C plus plus? Can it simulate all these other like uh, well known programming languages? If yes, Turing complete. If no, not. That's a kind of real oversimplification, but hopefully that kind of gets the idea across that like if you have a programming language that's non Turing complete there is some set of calculations that it just cannot do. So I'll take that let answer. Let me put that a different way, right? There's something really weird and unusual that we've gotten completely used to because we all walk around with computers in our pocket, right? You can download any app to your phone and make it do anything, right? And you don't really care whether you've got um, which particular hardware you've got on your phone, no matter what it is, you could write an app that would do the same thing on that phone. So the different pieces of hardware, that, you know, different, um, the different kinds of machines all actually have the same capabilities. You need to compile things a bit differently, but anything that runs on one, you can make run on the other. It's not like um, a printing press, which can do some stuff but can't do other stuff. Right before we only had machines that could do one thing. With the advent of stored program computers, which we've only had um, since after World War II, right? They just built the first ones for trying to do um, deal with cryptography. In fact, right, Turing worked on computers in the war, trying to break the German Enigma codes. Those were the first general-purpose stored program computers, and then they continued to develop them. Excuse me. They continued to develop them after the war. But till then, you didn't have this notion that you could have one machine that could do whatever any other machine in the class could do. So the class of things they can do is what's called Turing complete. So anything your computer can do, that's called Turing complete. If language is not Turing complete, that means it's less powerful than a full computer. So I'd like to add, I'd like to ask a follow-up question to that. We speak about Lambda Calculus, we speak about Turing Complete. And one of your earlier talks, you spoke about this quest in mathematics to solve all math issues. There was a quest early in the 30s to figure out exactly this formula or this set of rules can solve everything. Mm -hmm. is, this, is this Plutus's mission statement? Is this what they're trying to do for smart contracts? Are you trying to fix all the problems with smart contracts with Plutus? I know that's a loaded question, but... Um... That's a very loaded question. So the thing you're referring to is called the Entscheidungsproblem. And um, the German logician, uh, David Hilbert, came up with that. At the time, they thought that if you wrote down some, a problem precisely using logical notation, logic goes back to the ancient Greeks, but just writing down logic as a set of symbols that you can reason about, that's called symbolic logic. That only goes back to George Boole in the middle of the 1800s. It's really a pretty recent idea. And around 1900, um, Hilbert started to get involved with this. And one of the things he says, right, there must be an algorithm, a 
a computer program, except they didn't have stored program computers back then, but that's what they were thinking of. There must be an algorithm that could, um, if you wrote down a formula, it could just work out whether it's true or false. So it could decide any question of mathematics. And uh, the interesting thing is that in the 1930s, Kurt Gödel came along and showed uh, with what was called uh, incompleteness, and he said, "Nope, you can't do that. Uh, there will always uh, be questions that you can write out in symbols, but you still can't formally answer them." Uh, an example of his example of that was uh, you could actually write out in symbols what it meant for something to be provable. And then you could actually write down in symbols the statement, this statement is not provable. And, and then you're kind of in trouble because either it's uh, false, in which case it is provable, in which case you proved something that's false, which you'd really not like to do. Right? The whole point of proof is that when you prove something, you know it's true. So then it must be true, but then it's not provable. So there are true things that are not provable. And that was what actually, that's why we have computers now. Alonzo Church and Kurt Gödel and Alan Turing all came up with different models of what the modern computer can do, uh, trying to um, check whether, uh, what the power of computers were, to show that there were problems that you couldn't solve with a computer, you had to know what a computer could do. Um, so Lambda Calculus actually came out of all that. Now that's really different than the question you asked. It's a bit off your point, so I'm sorry about that. But I, I didn't want people confusing the Enchidux problem with what you were asking about. So the quest to do everything, in that sense, the answer turns out to be no, you can prove it's not possible. There are always interesting things to do that you can't get a computer to do. Um, but that doesn't mean computers can't do a huge amount. So then the question is, okay, well, what's the role of Plutus here? So um, as I mentioned, if you look at something like uh, Ethereum and the EVM and Solidity, those all have uh, a lot of well-known flaws in them. Things that anybody who's a professional at programming language would design would say, don't do that. Um, the example that I mentioned was you don't want to have overflow happen silently. You want to indicate that something's gone wrong when that occurs. Um, there's some other examples in terms of, um, in order to make it very flexible, Solidity is designed so that if you call a method that's not been defined, it calls a certain backup method and uses that. And for certain purposes, if you want to be really general about what you're doing, that can be helpful. If you want to be really secure in what you're doing, then if you, if you change one letter in a procedure call, having it call something else and do what that says, rather than saying, I don't recognize this, you've done something that I don't know about, that makes it difficult to make, write a secure program. So they made a choice that's great if you want to be flexible, but is a poor choice if you want to be secure. And for Solidity, Ethereum, and the EVM, being secure is the most important thing. So you can point to that choice again as being a poor choice, and that led to the first parity bug, the one that lost, I think it was about $30 million. So there are lots of things in Ethereum, the EVM, Solidity, that any expert would say, don't do that. And so our first goal in uh, Plutus, and in many of these other systems out there, is to just say, no, we don't want to repeat those mistakes. Everything that we know how to get right, we want to get right. Now, I want to sell Plutus, but I don't want to oversell it. So then you might say, okay, that's it. You've solved all the problems. Everybody will get everything right from here on. No, we don't know how to do that, I'm afraid. So doubtless, there will still be problems in all these systems, but we want to make sure to get rid of as many as we can. So the way you do that is, first of all, uh, you base it on known ideas in programming language design. In our case, we're going all the way back to the 1930s to pick ideas that are really rock solid. Second, do it open source, do it peer reviewed, so you get lots of people looking at it, and if you've got something wrong, they can tell you about it. 
So those are the main techniques we're trying to apply to get this right. And I'd love to tell you, that means we've got everything right and there will never ever be a possible exploit. But I don't think I can make that promise. All I can promise is that we're using the best techniques available to make sure that we don't have problems. So these exploits that you referred to, I, I remember Plutus Fest, I, I don't recall w which presenter said it, but something that really stood out to me was when one of the presenters said that when you make these languages, you want to ensure that the language does everything that you want it to do and nothing else. And it was that part when they said and nothing else, when, it re when I realized I was like, wow, these guys are on the right track because... I think it's that caveat and nothing else. That's where these languages get themselves into trouble. That's where the bugs come in. That's where the hackers come in the back doors. Is that correct that, that that's what that and the language does exactly what it's supposed to do and nothing else. Is that what that and nothing else part means? Um, I'm sorry, but I don't remember that comment. So I don't think I can comment helpfully on what you're say asking about there. Oh, okay, I thought the end, and nothing else meant that there's no exploits in there, that you can't um, overflow something, an integer, you, can, you can't cause a problem. Well, you certainly don't want to have exploits, but um, it turns out, right, the way you get rid of exploits is you think about it really hard, and you try to imagine what the exploits can be. This is why in security, it's so important to um, publish your plans for security so that other people can review them and tell you if there are issues there. And if you're trying to design a secure programming language, it's exactly the same thing. You have to publish it, you have to get the community to review it. And that's the way to make sure that you're as good as you can be. And you know, that's a comment I often see in the forums is people will say, hey, if this is open source and you publish anything, aren't you exposing it to hackers? But I think the, the opposite effect is what happens is, you're exposing it to all the smart people who can find all the holes. And if there's no holes, then hackers aren't a problem. Sebastian, you were going to say? Uh, wait, wait, wait. In answer to your question, I'll just tell you the key phrase people use for that. Right. The other approach is called security through obscurity. And right, some people try to do things that way. But generally, you just get into big problems and then you don't even know you've got a big problem. So it's widely agreed that the best bet is to publish. And then you actually need to have things in place so that if somebody finds a problem, they can tell the responsible people about it and they can fix that problem before they publish the problem. And then, of course, people could use that to create exploits. So part of this doing it in the open is you have techniques so that if somebody finds a problem, they can be responsible, tell you about it, and you can fix it before it gets exploited. Yeah, so I wanted to touch a bit on the security aspect that you keep bringing up. So part of, of Plutus is verified through Agda, and then parts of Plutus core are verified through uh, the K framework. So I was wondering if you could explain to our viewers who are maybe not so familiar with these kinds of uh, formal verification techniques, uh, what part is, is Agda, what is Agda, how does it work with the K framework, and how is it different than other uh, tools IOSK has mentioned in the past, such as Cock? Uh, okay, so there's a lot going on there. Um, so one whole part of programming language design is you come up with mathematical models of your languages and you can use those to characterize certain kinds of errors and prove certain kinds of errors won't arise. So the most popular example of this is type systems. You can actually characterize um, a range of errors and say, okay, these errors can't happen. So the most typical kind of error that you can get rid of is with the type system is um, when you apply a function, uh, you, well, first of all, you want to know the thing you're applying is a function. And if you give it a number, you want to know it's expecting a number. And then the type might also tell you what you're expecting to be returned, which might be another number or a string or what have you. So um, type systems, just rule out cases where you get something that you're not expecting. Um, languages like JavaScript are dynamically typed. Um, you can write a program, it won't tell you that, but it will at least detect it at runtime. A language like C, if you misuse it, you can pass it the wrong thing, it won't even know. 
Um, it used to be that they would design nuclear power plants using these old fashioned languages that didn't even have type systems. And then they discover a bug where they were um, calling a routine in the nuclear power plant, passing it information that it wasn't expecting. And then they would go to the extra effort to say, yeah, but that's not a type one error. That's only a type three error because even though we were passing it the wrong thing, it wouldn't cause it to go to meltdown. But I'm not really reassured by that. I think they should just be using languages where this can't happen. So we've got lots of mathematical models of these things. And then you try to prove properties like type soundness that says, right, at every point, you cannot have a type error. You can't get something not of the type this has been declared with. So if it says it's expecting a number, it will always get a number. So um, the most important property of the core languages used in Plutus, um, something called system F, which is a very flexibly typed lambda calculus. So as well as things having types like integer and string, you can say for every type A, this takes an A, a list of A, and it returns another list of A. Uh, and you can be sure that whatever the type of the input list is, things of the same type appear in the output list. So it's very flexible. It means you can do something like write sort that acts on things of any type, uh, but also it guarantees these strong typing properties. So there's a lot of experience improving these kinds of properties. And then there are various systems for writing down mathematical specifications of what you expect the language to do and a lot of systems for letting you carry through these proofs. So these things are usually called proof assistants, proof assistants. And um, there are a bunch of them out there. Koch is one, Isabel is one, Mizar is one, uh, and so on. And then Agda is one of these. And I know a fair about, amount about Agda because I just finished writing a textbook about it. It's called Programming Language Foundations in Agda. And if anybody wants to learn about Agda, uh, the textbook's freely available online. They can just go uh, searching for that name, Programming Language Foundations in Agda. And uh, if they want to, they could then learn about these techniques. Um, there's several other books out there for other things uh, like Coq, which do, which are used for very similar purpose. Um, I like, I prefer Agda, it's much better for teaching. And I think it's also um, sometimes better for writing these things in a way that people can actually read and understand the proofs. Coq is designed to, it helps you create the proof. Um, you actually write a program that creates the proof for you. Uh, but the result is that that kind of program, which is called a proof script, can be hard to read. You sort of have to execute it interactively to understand what it's doing. Whereas in Agda, the exact same language is used for writing programs and proving properties about programs. And that makes it a bit simpler and easier to use. Uh, in design, in modeling programming languages in Agda, um, has uh, a fellow named James Chapman uh, is doing our model of Plutus core in Agda and then proving these type soundness properties. And then you can have a light, slightly more efficient way of executing it. Sebastian mentioned these something like the CEK machine. So that's a bit more efficient way of executing it. That's what our actual implementation does. So then you want to prove that your two definitions are doing the same thing. And that will be the next bit of work that James is going to do. So more on the security aspect. So you're talking about how uh, Plutus will be a safer language because you, you know you guys are using Agda to help verify some parts of it because you have a type system to make sure you can get rid of invalid states. Stuff like uh, Plutus Core and JavaScript uh, can both be verified using the K framework with the work that the runtime verification folks has done. Uh, one thing is that the hassle component is kind of uh, well known to be hard to to verify. A lot of people, I think, over time have tried to formally verify Haskell in some way, shape, or form, and I, I don't think any of them have been particularly successful. And so, given the no, fact that you know that's not quite right, actually, no, there's been a lot of verification work done with Haskell. So, uh, an example of this is there's something called the um, SEL4 operating system. This is actually an operating system for mobile phones. And there have been a couple of uh, really impressive bits of work people have done 
with proof of systems like Koch. SEL4 is one of these where they verified an entire operating system. Now the actual operating system for efficiency purposes is written in C, but what they did was they started with Haskell, validated that, um, converted the Haskell into uh, Koch, validated that it was doing what it was supposed to do, and then wrote bits in C, and again validated that those corresponded to the Haskell routines. So you've got um, all the way down at our operating system formally validated, but Haskell was a key point of key step in making all that work. So even though Haskell itself um, is very complicated and you don't have any formal models of the entire Haskell language, uh, you can use it at the core of validating things because right, this, this key idea of lambda calculus, the key idea of um, you only have values that you're manipulating makes all of this go through in a fairly straightforward way. And so all the impressive things that have been done, like validating an operating system, validating an entire C compiler, have been done based on functional languages, Haskell or the functional language Galena that underlies Coq or what have you. Sorry, is Haskell based on, on C? Where, where's its origins or its roots? No, Haskell is not based on C at all. <laughs> Um, Haskell is based directly on lambda calculus. So this thing that Alonzo Church did in the 1930s, trying to understand what can a computer do. Um, there's been a direct line, as it were, from that all the way down to the modern functional languages. And um, Turing actually, uh, right, he had a different model of what a computer could do. He became Church's student. Um, so Turing wrote the first paper showing that what a Turing machine could do, lambda calculus could do, and vice versa. And in that paper, at the beginning of it, uh, he wrote, so that means um, from now on, you could just write all your programs in, quote, the more elegant lambda calculus. Uh, okay, thanks for clarifying that. Um, what I do have to do is um, I got to wrap up on a few questions and we'll touch on the the Reddit questions from our viewers, if that's okay. Yeah, in fact, I'm really excited to hear questions from Reddit. I think it's great that you guys are helping to create a conduit between um, the community out there and uh, those of us actually doing work on Plutus. I think that kind of conduit is really important. Okay, good. And the last question that we had kind of in the in the meat of the program here was, there's a lot of training courses out there in Haskell. I'm, I've seen a lot of media saying they're getting out there to train people in Haskell. Um, does that Haskell training include Plutus training? And is it Plutus included in that in the Haskell books? Or is there going to be a separate Plutus book? So um, Haskell's been around for... Um, a while now, since the late 90s. No, sorry, Haskell's been around since 1987. That would make it more than 30 years old now. There's lots and lots of training materials for Haskell. Um, I wrote a textbook with Richard Bird. That one's out of print. Richard's another one that's in print. There's huge numbers of other books out there. Um, and uh, there are also a number of MOOCs out there. So there are lots and lots of ways out there for people to learn Haskell. IOHK has been trying to get people trained up in Haskell, so it runs its own course. It ran an instance of that in Barbados last year. I went as a guest lecturer. Uh, the people working on it were great. They were learning both about Haskell and about how to program, uh, how to develop uh, cryptographic applications um, so that they would have the right skills for doing something like implementing Cardano. The next instance of the course is happening in Ethiopia. It will be taught, I'm told, to women only. Um, I hope to be a guest lecturer on it again. And for the new one, they are talking about adding a bit on at the end to teach Plutus. And there's been talk about, can we develop some kind of MOOC for Plutus? What kind of textbook should we be uh, publishing for Plutus? So that will be something separate that you would learn after you've learned Haskell. There are lots of resources for learning Haskell out there already, and we will be developing 
new resources for teaching people how to use Plutus. Uh, but that's, we're just at the beginning of that process. All right, thank you, Professor. And uh, Philippe, did you want to go into the Reddit questions? Uh, yes, we some... yes, we can go right into the Reddit questions. Um, so we have a question from Demesis X, so D E M E S I S X, and that was the most upvoted question. Uh, he actually has a series of questions, but let's take a let's take a random one. Um, Let's say, is there anything that you've added to Plutus that you wish existed when you started creating Haskell? No, so that's a really interesting question. Um, I would say that essentially the answer to that is no, because like you said before, you don't want to invent something new if you don't need to. And so we're just using Haskell itself as a language for doing everything that is off chain. And then we use a subset of Haskell, Plutus TX, uh, for the stuff that is on chain to everything that's there is there in Haskell. So in that sense, I would say, no, there's nothing in there um, that's not already in Haskell. There is one important difference, which is that Plutus um, TX is written in what's called a strict language, whereas Haskell is a lazy language. So, um, Lazy languages are really interesting. They um, don't do computation until you need it. And it's particularly helpful because it makes it easy to do stream processing. So you can generate a list a bit at a time as you need it. And that's very helpful for taking in a stream of data where you might not even know what's at the end of the stream yet and producing another stream of data. Uh, so Haskell has that property. The downside of being lazy is that it can be sometimes very difficult to do, uh, to analyze how much resource your program is going to take as it runs, because you have to figure out, oh, is it going to need this before you know, is it going to use this resource? So if you're doing resource analysis, it's actually easier to do that in a strict language. So we've made Plutus TX and what goes on the blockchain be a strict language so that it's a bit easier to do the resource analysis. And I've had talks with some of the other people in the Haskell community, like Simon Peyton Jones, and we've both agreed that now that we know more, if we were doing it over again, we probably would have made Haskell a strict language with support to make things lazy if you need it, whereas what it actually is is a lazy language with support to make things strict if you need it. So we probably would have changed that default. OK, um, we have another question. Um, what do you envision smart contracts being used for? Um, I, I remember looking on the Plutus site, you were making, you were mentioning something on the Plutus site. It mentioned something about inter interest rate swap contracts. And, uh -huh. um, if people are not familiar with that, it's basically ways for financial institutions to speculate on rising and falling interest rates. So one party, if interest rates skyrocket, they benefit versus if they drop the other party benefits, but is this, is this a plausible use case in the future? Do you see any other possible use cases for smart contracts within Plutus besides uh, interest rate swap contracts? And if, if that's a main one, could you go into more detail about that? So I think everybody is still trying to figure out what blockchains are gonna be good for and what smart contracts are gonna be good for. So um, there is this really one really important smart contract that I should explain to you, but we don't know what it is yet, right? We haven't worked out what that is. So there are little small things that people look at like crowdfunding and uh, credit swaps and a bunch of little things, and those will all be important. But I think the most important ones, we don't know what they are yet. And that of course is what's great about computer programs is you can program a computer to do anything. So we've got these smart contract languages. I'm sure the most important uses of them are gonna be ones we don't have yet. It's an amazing answer. Yes. I never thought of it that way. I always think in the context of how's Plutus can help me buy a taco at the store. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, um, let's, let's try to hit one more question. Mm -hmm. um, so the last question, let's... Um, is there anything that you wanted Plutus to be capable of that ended up not being realistic? 
Oh, is there anything we wanted Plutus to do that's not realistic? Yep, I mentioned it. We want it to be absolutely bulletproof, so nothing ever, ever could go wrong. We don't know how to do that. Okay. We, we would love to make it absolutely impossible for things to go wrong, but making that promise would be promising more than we can do. So all I can promise is that we're going to do everything humanly possible. We're going to make use of the best uh, known design principles. We're going to avoid the known faults like um, not catching overflow or uh, doing these uh, default procedure calls in Ethereum. Uh, and we're going to have lots of eyes on it, try to ensure that there's nothing wrong. And we're going to have peer review to try to ensure that there's nothing wrong. Uh, but I'd love to be able to say nothing could ever go wrong. And I can't say that. That is a great answer. Um, so thanks everyone for joining us. Thanks to the Reddit community for dropping off questions. Thanks to everyone for emailing us at the Cardano effect at gmail.com. Um, keep on reaching out to us. We are going to have, we're going to continue having all-star guests on this podcast. We had a legend today on the podcast and we are very thankful that he came, that he came in today. So today's episode was all about Plutus. Professor Wadler, if you ever want to come and rejoin us for whatever project you're working on or just to talk, you are welcome to join us whenever. We really appreciate you. Sebastian, Rick, and I, it's it's an honor to have you on. We, it really is. And um, thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. I want to thank uh, the three of you for um, this opportunity. I want to thank the community out there for um, sending in questions. And I think that dialogue between the community and uh, the people doing the language design is really important. And so I think you're actually doing a really important job. And um, I hope that this conduit remains wide open and uh, that fruitful things happen in the interchange uh, between us and the community. Because it, it's, uh, it's really bad if things are just sort of all flow in one direction. The designers are perfect and they tell the community what they're going to do. That's not the way it works in practice. You really need a dialogue with the community. And so I'm really pleased to see this started. And I do hope to come back as part of continuing that dialogue. Thank you, Professor. Have a Merry Cardano Christmas and Happy New Year. All right, thanks everyone. Bye.